Chapter 5, Diagon Alley Harry woke up early the next morning. Although he could tell it was daylight, he kept his eyes shut tight. It was a dream, he told himself firmly. I dreamed a giant called Hagrid came to tell me I was going to school for wizards. When I open my eyes, I'll be in my, own, my cupboard. There was suddenly a loud tapping noise. And there's Aunt Petunia knocking on the door, Harry thought. His heart sinking, but he still didn't open his eyes. It had been such a good dream. Tap, tap, tap. All right, Harry mumbled. I'm getting up. He sat up, and Hagrid's heavy coat fell off him. The hut was full of sunlight. The storm was over. Hagrid himself was asleep on the collapsed sofa, and there was an owl tapping its claw on the window. The newspaper held it in its beak. Harry scrambled to, the, to his feet. So happy he felt a large balloon swelling up inside him. He went straight to the window and jerked it open. They all swooped in and dropped a newspaper on top of Hagrid, who didn't wake up. The owl then fluttered onto the floor and began to attack Hagrid's coat. Don't do that! Hagrid tried to wave the owl out of the way, but it snapped its beak fiercely at him and carried only and carried on savaging the coat. Hagrid, said Harry loudly, there's an owl. Pay him. Hagrid grunted into the sofa. What? He wants pay him for deliveries of the paper. Look in, in the pockets. Hagrid's coat seemed to be made of nothing but pockets. Bunches of keys and slugs and pellets and balls and strings and peppermint humbugs and tea bags. And finally, Harry pulled out a handful of strange looking coins. Give him five five nuts, Hagrid said sleepily. Knuts? Yeah, the little bronze ones. Harry counted out five little bronze coins, and the owl held out his leg so Harry could put the money into the small leather pouch tied to it. Then he flew off through the open window. Hagrid yawned loudly and sat up and stretched. Oh, best be off, Harry. Lots to do today. Get up into London to buy all your stuff for school. Harry was turning over his wizard's coin and looking at them. He had just thought of something that made him feel as though the happy balloon inside him had got a puncture. Um, Hagrid? Mm, said Hagrid, who was pulling up his on his huge boots. I haven't got any money. And you heard Uncle Vernon last night. He won't pay for me to go to learn magic. Oh, don't worry about that. Hagrid said Hagrid, standing and stretching his head. Do you think your parents didn't leave you anything? But if their house was destroyed, they didn't keep gold in the house, boy. Nah, first stop for you is Gingrats, Wizard's Bank. Have a sausage. They're not bad, Cole. And I wouldn't say no to you a bite of your birthday cake, neither. Wizards have banks? Just one, Gringotts, run by goblins. Harry dropped a bit of the sausage he was holding. Goblins? Yeah. So yeah, he'd mad to try to rob it. I'll tell you the truth of that. Never mess with goblins, Harry. Gringotts is the safest place in the world for anything you want to keep safe. Except in maybe Hogwarts. As a matter of fact, I gotta visit Gringotts anyways. For Dumbledore, Hogwarts business. Hagrid drew himself up so proudly. He usually gets me to do the important stuff for him. You know, fetching you, getting things from Gringotts. He knows he can trust me, you see. Got everything? Come on, then. He followed Hagrid out to the rock. The sky was quite clear. Now and the sea was gleamed in the sunlight. And the boat Uncle Vernon had hired was still there with a lot of water at, in the bottom after the storm. How did you get here? Harry asked as he looked around for another boat. Flew, said Hagrid. Flew? Yeah. But we'll go back in this. Not supposed to use your magic now that I've got you. They settled down in the boat. Harry, still staring at Hagrid, trying to imagine him flying. Seems a shame to row, though. And Hagrid giving Harry another look, a sideways look. If ya, uh, if I were to hmm, speed things up a bit, 
Would you mind not mentioning it at Hogwarts? Of course not, said Harry, eager to see more magic. Hagrid pulled out the pink umbrella again, tapped it twice on the side of the boat, and they sped off towards the land. Why would you be mad to try to rob Gringotts, Henry asked. Spells, enchantments, said Hagrid, unfolding the newspaper as he spoke. They say there's dragons guarding the high security vaults. And you gotta find your way. Gingrats has hundreds of miles under London, see? Deep under, underground. Yeah, you'd die of a hunger trying to get out there, even if you did manage to get your hands on something. Harry sat up, sat through the, and, and thought about while Hagrid was reading his newspaper, the Daily Prophet. Daily, or Harry learned from Uncle Vernon that people liked to be left alone when they did this, but it was very difficult. He'd never had so many questions in his life. Oh, ministry of mag mag magic messing things up as usual, Hagrid muttered, turning the page. There's a ministry of magic? Hagrid, or Harry asked before he could stop himself. Of course, said Hagrid. They weren't Dumbledore for minister, of course, but he'd never leave Hogwarts. So old Cornelius Fudge got the job. Bungler, if there ever was one. So he pelts Dumbledore with owls every morning, asking for advice. But what does the Ministry of Magic do? Well, their main job is to keep the muggles that still witches and wizards up and down the country. Why? Why blimey, Harry? Be watching magic solutions their problems. Nah, we'd be best left alone. At that moment, the boat bumped gently into the harbor while Hagrid folded up his newspaper and clambered onto the steps of the street. Passersby stared a lot at Hagrid as they walked through the little town and station. Harry couldn't blame them. Not only was Hagrid twice as tall as anyone, he kept pointing in perfectly ordinary things like parking meters and saying loudly, See that, Harry? <laughs> things these muggles dream up, eh? Hagrid, said Harry, panting a bit, running to keep up. Did you say that there were dragons at Gringotts? Well, so they say, Hagrid said. Crikey! I'd like a dragon. You'd like one? Want one ever since I was a kid. Here we go. They reached the station. There was a train at London. In five minutes time, Hagrid, who didn't understand muggle money, as he called it, gave the bills to Harry so he could buy their tickets. People stared more than ever on the train. Hagrid took up two seats and sat knitting when look <laughs> and sat knitting what looked like a canary yellow circus tent. Still got your letter, Harry? He asked as he counted the stitches. Harry took the parchment envelope out of his pocket. Good, Hagrid. There's a list in there, everything you need. Harry unfolded the second piece of paper. He had noticed that the night before. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uniform. First year students will require three sets of plain work robes, black. One plain pointed hat, black for daily wear, one pair of protective gloves, dragon hide or similar, one winter cloak, black or silver fastenings, and silver fastenings. Please note all pupils' clothes should carry name tags. Course books. All students should have a copy of the following books. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 1, by Miranda Goshock. The History of Magic, by Bathilda Bagshot. Magical Theory by Aldebert Waffling. The Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration by Emmerich Switch. 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi by Philadelphia Spore. Magic's Daughters and Potions by Aracinus Jigger. Fantastic Beasts, Where to Find Them by Newt Scamander. And The Dark Forces Guide to Self-Protection by Quentin Trimble. Other equipment, one wand, one cauldron, pewter standard size two, one set of glass or crystal files, one telescope, one C, brass scales, 
Students may also bring an owl or cat or a toad. Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomsticks. Can we buy all this in London? Harry wondered. If you show up where, if you show, if you know where to go, said Her Hagrid. Harry had never been to London before, although Hagrid seemed to know what, where he was going. He was obviously not used to getting there the ordinary way. He got stuck in the ticket barrier with the underground and complained loudly that the seats were too small and the trains too slow. I don't know how muggles manage without magic, he said, as he climbed down the broken escalator that led to the bustling road lined with stop shops. Hagrid was so huge that he parted the crowd easily. All Harry had to do was keep behind him. The past bookshops and music stores and hamburger restaurants and cinemas, but nowhere that looked like he could sell magic wand. It was just an ordinary street full of ordinary people. Could there really be piles of wizards, gold buried beneath mile, beneath them, miles beneath them? Were there really shops in, that sold spell books and broomsticks? Might this not all be some huge joke that the Dursleys had cooked up? If Harry hadn't known that the Dursleys had no sense of humor, he might have thought that of it so somehow. Even though everything Hagrid had told him so far was unbelievable, Harry couldn't help but trusting him. This is it, said Hagrid, coming to a halt. The Leaky Cauldron. It's a famous place. It was a tiny, grubby-looking old pub. If Hagrid hadn't pointed it out, Harry would have missed, wouldn't have noticed it was there. The people hurrying by didn't glance at it. Their eyes slid from the big bookshop to the one side of the record shop. The others, if, as if they could see the leaky couldn't see the leaky cauldron at all. In fact, Harry had the most peculiar feeling that only he and Hagrid could see it. Before he could mention this, Hagrid had steered him inside. For a famous place was very dark, shabby, and a few old women sitting in the corner drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man on top, on, in the top, in a top hat, was talking to the old bartender, who was quite bald and looked like a toothless walnut. <laughs> the low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everyone seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him. The bartender reached for a glass, saying, "The usual, Hagrid? Can't, Tom. I'm on a Hogwarts business," said Hagrid chapping his great hands on Harry's shoulder and making Harry's knees buckle. Good Lord, said the bartender peering at Harry. Is this, can this be? The, luck, lucky, the leaky cauldron had suddenly gone completely still and silent. Bless my soul, whispered the bartender. Harry Potter, what an honor. He hurried out from behind the bar and rushed toward Harry seized his hand in tears, with tears in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr. Potter. Welcome back. Harry didn't know what to say. Everyone was looking at him. The old woman with the pipe was puffing on it without realizing it had gone out. Hagrid was beaming. Then there was a great scraping of chairs. Next moment, Harry found himself shaking hands with everyone in the leaky cauldron. Doris Crockford, Mr. Potter. Can't believe I'm meeting you here at last. So proud, Mr. Potter. I'm just so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand. I'm all a flutter. Delighted, Mr. Potter. Just can't tell you. Diggle's the name. Dedalus De Diggle. I've seen you before, said Harry, as Dedalus Diggle's top hat fell off in excitement. You bowed to me once at a, in a shop. He remembers, cried Douglas Diggle, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembers me. Harry shook his hand again and again. Doris Crockford kept coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward very nervously. One of his eyes was twitching. Professor Quirrell, said Hagrid. Harry, Professor Quirrell will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. P -p Potter, stammered Professor Quirrell, grasping Harry's hand. Can't, can't, can't tell you how p -p -p pleased I am to meet you. What sort of magic do you teach, Professor Quirrell? D defense against the d d dark arts, muttered Professor Quirrell, as though he'd rather not think about it. N not that you need, need it, pa eh, pa pa Potter, he laughed nervously. 
You'll be get, getting all your equipment, I suppose. I've got, got to pick up a new book book on vampires myself. He looked terrified at the very thought. But the others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to himself. It took him almost ten minutes to get away from them all. Haggard managed to make himself heard over the t babble. Must get on! Lots to buy! Come on, eh? Doris Crawford shook Harry's hand one last time, and Haggard led them through the bar into the small, walled courtyard. They were there as nothing but trash cans and a few weeds. Haggard grinned at Harry. Told you, didn't I? Told you you were famous. Even Professor Quirrell's trembling to meet you. Mind... Mind you, he usually trembling. Is he always that nervous? Oh, yeah, poor bloke. Brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but then he took a year off to get some first-hand experience. Then he met vampires in, black fo in the Black Forest, and they're a nasty bit of trouble with the bag. Never been the same since. Scared of the students. Scared of his own subject. Now... Where's me umbrella? Vampires? Hags? Harry's head was swimming. Haggard, mean, meanwhile, was counting the bricks above the wall in the trash can. Three, up, two, across, he muttered. Right. Stand back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he had touched quivered. It wriggled. In the middle, a small hole appeared, and it grew wider and wider. A second later, they were facing an archway large enough for even Haggard to arch, an archway onto a cobbled street twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Haggard, to Diagon Alley. He grinned at Harry's amazement. They st stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back to the solid wall. The sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons, all sizes, copper, brass, pewter, silver, self-stirring, collapsible, and a sign hung over there. Yeah, you'll be needing one of these, said Hagrid, but we got to get your money first. Harry wished he, was, he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked the street, trying to look at everything at once. The shop's the things inside, outside, the people doing their shopping, a plump woman outside the apothecary was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Ah, dragon liver, 16 sickles an ounce. They're mad. A low, soft hooting came from the dark shop with a sign saying, Alopes, Owls, Emporium, Tawny, Screech, Brown, brown Barn, and Snowy, several boys about of Harry Potter's age, had their noses pressed against the windows and broomsticks in it. Look, Harry, heard one of them say. The new Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes and shops selling telescopes and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bat spleens and eels' eyes and tottering piles of spell books and quills and rolls of parchment potions, bottles, globes of the moon. Ringots, said Hagrid. They had reached the snowy white building. It towered over all the little shops. Standing out beside the burnished bronze doors where uniform scarlet and gold was. Yeah, that's a goblin, said Haggard quietly, as they walked through the white stone steps toward him. That goblin was about a head shorter than Harry, and he had swarthy, clever face, pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors, silver this time, with the words engraved, Ever a stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take, but not to, but do not earn, must pay most dearly in the, in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware, or find more than a treasure there. Like I said, you're mad to try to rob it, said Hagrid.
A pair of goblins bowed them through through the silver doors, and they were in vast marble hall. About 100 more goblins were sitting in high stools behind long counters, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins, brass scales, examining precious stones through eyeglasses. There were too many doors to count leading off the halls, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made for one of the count for the counter. Morning, said Hagrid to a free goblin. We've come to take some money out of Mr. Harry Potter's safe. You have this key, sir? Got it somewhere. Hagrid had started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of moldy dog biscuits over the goblin's books of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on the right weighing a pile of rubies as big as a as a glowing glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny, tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. Hmm, that seems to be in order. And I also got a letter from Professor Dumbledore, sir. And Hagrid, importantly, throwing his chest up. It's about you know who. And you know what. In Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I will have someone take you down to both vaults. Grip's hook. Grip hook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back in his pocket, he and Harry followed the grip hook towards one of the doors leading off to the hall. What's you know what in vault 713? Harry asked. Can't tell you that, said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret Hogwarts business. Dumbledore's trusting me more and more in my jo jobs worth to tell you that grip hook held the door open for them harry who had expected more marble was surprised that there was a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches it sloped steeply down towards where there was a little railway tracks in the floor grip hook whistled and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks towards them they climbed in haggard with some difficulty and we're off the first, at first they just hurled through a maze of twirling, twisting passages. Passages. Harry tried to remember left, right, right, left, middle fork, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know only one way because Griphook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept his eyes wide open. Once he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of a passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon. But too late. They plunged even deeper, passing into the ground lake where the huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling to the floor. I never know, Harry called up to Hagrid over the noise. What's the difference between a stalactite and a stalagmite? Stalagmites. Got an M in it, said Hagrid. <laughs> and don't ask me questions just now. I think I'm going to be sick. He looked very green, and when the cart stopped at last, he sighed a small door in the passage while Hagger got out and had to lean against the wall to stop his knees from trembling. Grip Hook unlocked the door, and a lot of green smoke came billowing out. And as, as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of bron bronze cr nuts. All yours, Hagger smiled. All Harry's? It was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this, or they'd have taken it from her faster than a blink, uh, faster than any kind of blinking. How had they complained how much Harry cost them to keep? And all this time, there had been a small fortune belonging to him buried deep in under London. Haggard helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon is twenty-nine nuts or a sickle. It's easy enough, right? That should be enough for a couple of terms. We'll, we'll keep the rest safe for you. He turned to Grip Hook. Vault 713 now, please. Can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Grip Hook. 
They were even deeper now, gathering speed. The air became colder and colder, and they hurtled around tight corners and went rattling over the underground ravine, and Harry leaned over to the side to try to see what, what was down in the dark bottom, but Hagger groaned and pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. The vault 713 had no keyhole. Stand back, Griphook said importantly. He stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers, and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringox goblin tried that, they'd be un they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Griphook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside, Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Griphook, with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside the top secrecy vault. Harry was sure he leaned forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels, very least, but some he thought it was empty. And he noticed a grubby little package wrapped up in a brown paper bag lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Hagrid, or Harry longed to know what it was, but he knew better than to ask. Come on, back to the infernal cart, and don't talk to me till on the way back. It's best if I just keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. <coughs> One wild car, cart ride letter later, they stood blinking in the sunlight outside Gringotts. Harry didn't know what to, to uh, know where to run to first, and he had a bag full of money. He didn't know how many galleons there were in a pound to know how much, what he was holding more money than he had ever had in his whole life, more money than even Dudley ever had. Might as well get your uniform, said Harry, or Hagrid, nodding towards Madame Malf Malkin's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slipped off for a pick-me-up a little leaky cauldron. I hate those them Gringotts carts. He did still look a little bit sick, so Harry entered Madame Milken's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Milken was squat, smiling, which dressed all in, in mauve. Hogwarts, dear? She said as Harry entered, started to speak. Got the lot here. Another young man being fitted up just now, in fact, in the back. Of the shop was a boy with a pale, pointed face, was standing on a footstool. While the second witch spinned the long black road, Madame Malcolm stood Harry on a stool next to him, slipped a, a long robe over his head, and began to pin it right to the right length. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts, too? Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying me books. And my mother's up the street looking at wands, said the boy. He had a bored, drawing, drawing voice. Then I'm going to drag them off and to look up racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully my father into getting me one, and I'll smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Have you got your own broom, the boy went on. No, said Harry. Play Quidditch at all. No, said Harry again. Wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house. And I must say, I agree. Know what house you'll be in yet? No, said Harry, feeling more stupid at the, by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I will be Slytherin, for all my whole family has been. Imagine being Hufflepuff. Huh, I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Mm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. I say, look at that man, the boy suddenly said, nodding towards the front row window. Haggard was standing there, grinning at Harry and pointing to two large ice creams to show that he couldn't come in. That's Haggard, said Harry, pleased to know something the boy didn't know. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy, I've heard of him. He's a sort of servant there, isn't he? He's a gamekeeper said Harry. He was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I heard he is that sort of savage. Lives in a hut on the school grounds and everyone knew. Now, it, and every now and then he gets drunk and tries to do magic and ends up setting fire to his bed. I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you? said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead said Harry shortly. 
He didn't feel like much going into the matter with this boy. Oh, sorry, said the other, not sounding sorry at all. But were they were our kind, weren't they? They were a witch and a wizard, if that's what you mean. I really don't think they should let that other sword in, do you? They just sort of not the same. They should never be brought up to know our ways. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts until they get their letter. Imagine, I think I should keep in the old wizarding families. What's your surname anyway? But before Harry could answer, Madam Milk Malkin said, Oh, that's you, Don, my dear. And Harry, not sorry for the excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped down from the footstool. Well, I'll see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drawling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream Hagrid bought for him. Chocolate with raspberry chopped nuts. What's up? said Hagrid. Nothing. Harry lied. He stopped to buy parchment, quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink change color when you wrote. Then, When he then left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's Quidditch? Blimey, Harry! I keep forgetting you. How little you know? Not about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy and Madame Melkins. Ah, and he said people from muggle families shouldn't even be allowed in. You're not from a muggle family. If he'd known who you were, he's grown up knowing your name as if his parents were wizarding folks. You saw that everyone in Leaky Cauldron was like when they saw you. Anyways, anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I ever saw were the ones, the magic come a long line of muggles. Look at your mom. Look what she had for a sister. So what is Quidditch? It's our sport. A wizard sport. It's like, like soccer in the muggle world. Everyone follows a Quidditch. Play up in the, the air with broomsticks. And there's five, four balls. Sort of hard to explain the rules. And... What is Slytherin and Hufflepuff? Schoolhouses. There's four. Everyone says Hufflepuffs are a lot of O'Duffers, but... I bet I'm a Hufflepuff, said Harry gloomily. Ha! Better Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Had Hagrid darkly. There's not a single witch worth a or wizard who went bad that wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Vol... I mean, sorry. You know who was at Hogwarts? Yes, years and years ago, said Hagrid. They bought Harry's tool, school books and shopped the flourish and blots where the shelves were stacked with ceilings with books, large paving stones around the, the leather, books the size of postage stamps in covers and silk books of the peculiar symbols and few books with nothing in them at all, even Dudley who had never read anything, would have been gone wild to get his hands on some of these. Hagrid almost had to drag Harry away from the curses and courses. Bewitch your friends, befuddle your enemies with the latest ravages, hair loss, jelly legs, tongue tying, and much, much more by Professor Vindictus Viridin. I was trying to find out why, how to curse Dudley. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the muggle world, except in very special circumstances, said Hagrid. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them curses yet. You'll need a lot more study before you get to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let bear Harry buy a single or solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on your list. But they got the nice set of scales for weighing potions and ingredients in collapsible brass telescope. Then they visited the apothecary, which was fascinating enough to make up for the horrible smell and mixtures of bad eggs and rotted cabbages. Barrels of slimy stuff stood on the floor. Jars of herbs, dried roots, and brilliant powders lined the walls and bundles of feathers, strings and fangs, and snarl claws hung from the ceiling. While Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for the supply of stone base of stone some basic potion ingredients for Harry, Harry himself examined the silver unicorns horns and the twenty-one gallon 
Each had minuscule glittery black beetle eyes, five nuts a scoop. Outside the apothecary, Hagrid checked Harry's list again. Just your wand left. Oh, yeah. And I still got you your birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to, to tell you, tell you what. I'll get your animal. Not a toe. Toes went out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at. And I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get you an owl. And the kids, all the kids want owl. They're dead useful. Carry your mail and everything. Twenty minutes later, they left the Ilops Owl Emporium, which had been dark and full of rustling and flickering jewel bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage that held a beautiful snowy owl, fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding like he like Professor Quirrell. Don't mention it, Harry said Hagrid gruffly. Don't expect you've had a lot of presents from the Dursleys. Just Ollivander's left now. The only place for wand is Ollivander's. And yeah, you gotta have the best wand. A magic wand. This is what Harry had been looking forward to. The last shop was narrow, shabby, peeling gold letters off the door. Ollivander's. Red Ollivander's. Makers of fine wands since... 382 B.C. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell from, rang somewhere in the depths of the shop. They stepped inside. It was a tiny place, empty except for a single spindly chair that Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely, though he entered into a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of, few, a lot of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead through the thousands and narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in there seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon, said a voice, soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too, because there was a cloud of crunching noise and a lot of quickly, quickly off the spindly chair. The old man standing in front of them has wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry, said Harry Aqua. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was here herself buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would have, he could blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand. Eleven inches, pliable, little more power, excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father's favored it. But really, the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he now and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where... Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with the long white fingers. I'm sorry to say. I sewed the wound that did this, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches. Yes, powerful wand, very powerful and in the wrong hands. Well, if I had known what the wand was going to do, go into the world to do, he shook his head and then said, Harry in relief spotted Hagrid. Rubus! Rubus Hagrid! How nice to see you again. Oak, 16 inches. Rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir. Yes, sir, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one. But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander suddenly stern. Uh, er, yeah. Yeah, they did. Yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Harry noticed he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. And he pulled a long tape measure out with silver markings in his pocket. 
which is your wand, um? Er, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm. That's it. He measured Harry from the shoulder to his finger, the wrist to the elbow, the shoulder to the floor, the knee to the armpit, around his head. He measured. He said, every Ollivander wand has a core of powerful magic substance, Mr. Potter. We use unknown unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, heart strings of a dragon. No two Ollivander wands are the same. And just as no two unicorn dragons or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course, you will never, ever get such good results with another wizard wand. Harry suddenly realized that the tape measure was now measuring between the nostrils and doing this on its own. Mr. Ollivander was flitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. Ah, that will do, he said to the tape measure, and it crumpled up into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr. Potter, try this one. Beech wood and dragon heart string, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand, feeling foolish, and waved it a bit, but Mr. Allender snatched out of his hand at once. Oh, maple phoenix feather, seven inches, quite whippy, let's try. Harry tried, but he hardly had it raised when he got two snatched from Mr. Ollivander. No, no, no. Here, ebony unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, try it, try it out. Harry tried it and tried, but he had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tired wands mounting higher and higher, and the spindly chair. The, the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled on the shelves, the happier Harry seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect match. Here somewhere, I wonder, now yes. Why not? Unusual combination. Holly and Phoenix feather, 11 inches and 9, supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head, brought it swishing down through the air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot out from the end like fireworks through dancing spots of light on the walk. Hagrid whooped and clapped and Mr. Ollivander cried, Oh, bravo! Yes, indeed. Oh, very good. Well, well, well. How curious. How very curious. He put Harry's wand back into the box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, Curious. Hmm, curious. Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed Harry with a pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever made and ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand, it so happens that the phoenix whose tail's feather is in your wand gave another feather, just one other. It is very curious indeed as to who should be destined for that wand, but its brother. Why, its brother gave you that scar. Harry swallowed. Yes, thirteen and a half inches, you. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember? I think we must, must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who shall not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great things. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed from them from the shop. Later that afternoon, the sun hung, the sun, sun hung low in the sky, as Harry and Hagrid made their way back to Diagon Alley and back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawking at them at the end of the underground rate laden as they were with all their funny-shaped packages with the snowy owl asleep in his cage and on Harry's lap. Another escalator out into the Paddington station. Harry only realized there when he Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before you, your train leaves, he said. Harry bought a hamburger and sat down in the plastic seats to eat them. Hagrid was looking around. Everything looked strange somehow. You all right, Harry? Very quiet, said Hagrid. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He just had been the best birthday of his life, and yet he chewed the hamburger trying to find the words. 
Everyone thinks I'm special, he said. All those people in the leaky culture and Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander, but I, I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous and I can't even remember why, what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Volt, I'm sorry, I mean the night my parents died. Hagrid leaned on the table behind the wild beast and the eyebrows. He wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out, and that's always hard. But you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. I still do, as a matter of fact. Hagrid held Terry onto the train that would take him back to the Dursleys when he handed him the envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, he said. First of September, King's Cross. All It's all on your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys, send me a letter with your owl. She'll know where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to wa watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose to the seat, pressed his nose against the windows, and but blinked, and Hagrid was gone. <laughs>